Hello and welcome to GMBN Tech Ask, the show where you've used hashtag AskGMBN Tech down in the comments of any of our videos so we can pick it up, try and answer it. Isn't that right, Anne? Try is the key word. Yeah. You're testing us. <laughs> All right, my first question is from, well, Freeze. I don't know if that's Mr. Freeze, as in Batman. He sounds but, cool either yeah, way. Yeah, he's got a really long question which I'll put on screen, but he's effectively asking me, um, will lubricating the caliper pistons contaminate my brake pads, uh, for example, after rain? because obviously lubricating the calipers uh, or the pistons, when they come out, you'll be using either dot fluid or mineral oil, depending on what brake model you have, and that will lubricate them and get them working nicely, yeah. uh, I think is the short way of saying it. Um, and that's great, but then you don't want that oil on your pads, because if it does, it could contaminate them and they may not work very well um, with the contact on the rotors. So. Long story short, uh, yes, you should be wiping that off or you should be using isopropyl alcohol after you've done your job to clean it all out and then put your pads back in, hopefully safe within the knowledge that they're not going to be contaminated. Uh, yeah, contaminated pads is not good. So not good. And I've never brought a pad back from that death either. No, you can't. No. No, it's dead. <laughs> um, also, any more? No, that's... No, that's yeah, Okay, it. cool. No, do you have anything to add? No, good. Okay. Uh, wear, wear gloves. <laughs> All right, yeah. Especially with isopropyl alcohol, it can dry your hands. So. Mm, and dot fluid too. Yeah, dot fluid is really McGroom as well, so yeah. Mm -hmm. um, awesome, I've got a question from North Star Freeride 41. Ooh. I wonder if he rides North Star and rides freely. That'd be good. I wonder if he's 41. Oh, didn't think of that. <laughs> These names. Um, he has a Niner Air 9. Oh, I used to have one of those. Very nice bike. Uh, it's spec to the 120 mil fork, and he wants to know if he can go down to a 100 mil fork. Um, yeah, I mean, depending on which model it is, um, because there was a couple of iterations. So, yeah, I mean, you're going to drop the the bars, you're going to lower the front of the bike because it's 20 mil lower. Well, actually, we say 20 mil lower, that's actual travel. The fork isn't going to be the axle crane isn't going to be actually 20 mil per se. It'll be maybe 19, maybe 15 mil shorter. Um, so that has knock-on effects to how the bike's going to handle, so it will handle a little bit quicker. So if you're riding cross-country and it's really techy and twisty and turny, then actually a steeper head angle might work. It's also going to drop the bottom bracket, so that's something else to be mindful of. Um, and as it's a hardtail, it's kind of tricky to, yeah, to do any other changes. So if you put an angle set in, you'd only make it... Well, if you slacker made it slacker, you'd make it lower. If you made it steeper, well, not sure you'd want to make it that steep. So, yeah, you can. Just be mindful that there'll be some subtle changes to, to geometry, which could be, could be fine. Could be. Could be terrible. Who knows? Uh, so, all distretmanus, probably pronounced, I don't know what that is. But basically, he said, fat bikes, why does the industry offer HCHT fat frame design? Uh, I'm not sure what that means, but it basically goes in to say that all the fat bikes he's been looking for are too steep and he wants something that's more trail friendly um, and more akin to modern geometry. So, he's found a crutch, which is literally the only bike I found that has a 64.5 degree head angle. All the other fat bikes that I looked at do have around about 69 degree head angle. So, you know, even looking at Norco, who I thought would for sure be doing a trail fat bike, yeah. uh, is still running a 69 degree head angle. Whether that's bad or not is by the by, you want something that is slacker. And I'm afraid the bad news is I don't think it exists outside the crutch. Um, so... Uh, Possibly mm. options. Pole looks like pole. Oh, they used to do a fat bike. I'm not sure if they still do. They definitely do a plus. Remember that? Yeah. They do a plus hardtail, and I think that is extremely slack. So that's an oh. option. Other option is like the Surly or Salsas. No, they're all too steep. Yes, Surly will be steep, but from memory, they've got forty-four degree. Um, 44 degree, 44 mil uh, head tube. So you'd be able to get a slack set for that. So you'd be able oh, to get it slacker. A good shout. But you'd only maybe get it to 66. I would argue, yes. if you're not running a suspension fork, do you really want 64? That is. He might do. Slack. I know some people who do downhill on fat bikes and they love it. Um, but yeah, I think the angle set, um, slackening the head angle of something that exists and getting it to 66 is a pretty good compromise, actually. I hadn't thought about that. Um, so, but if you're looking to buy one outright, 
You might actually want to think about a custom frame is my suggestion because getting a steel frame made up in the geometry that you want might not actually be as expensive as you think with a local frame builder. So try and find some local frame builders and see what you can come up with. Yeah, great shout. Um, oh, as <laughs> dope pedal? Yes. <laughs> as as dope doll. Anyway, uh, we'll skip over the name. Sorry for butchering your name massively. I do apologise. He's got a Trek Pro Calibre, lovely XC bike, from 2018. Um, and he wants to change the fork from a RockShox Recon 100mm. Uh, he wants to upgrade it to a SID 120. Um, from memory, Pro Calibre was an XC bike, XC in 2018, which doesn't, isn't that long ago, was quite steep and was very much 100 mil is what you mm -hmm. have. And also, if it was designed by the manufacturer to have a 100 mil fork, if you stick a 120 on it, okay, there's some geometry changes that, which are probably quite nice, like we're going to slack it out, we'll lift the bottom bracket a bit, which may be good if you're living somewhere rocky, might not be. Um, the problem is I don't think the frame is designed for it, and thus the extra leverage that this longer fork will apply to it is probably not a winner. Mm. So... Yeah. My question is, if you're trying to change from a Recon to a SID and you're thinking about spending that money on a SID to get better suspension, what is it you're looking for? Do you actually need longer travel or is it that you just wanted a better fork um, and the sort of question of 120 has just arisen after that? Because a 100mm SID is an incredibly good fork. Uh, it's going to be a lot better than the Recon you're running at the moment and you might actually just be happy with a 100mm SID instead. So um, I would maybe look in... We'll think about that as an option too. Bare suspension, not more suspension. Very yes, good, like that. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and then my final question. Oh no, not final. Penultimate question from Prinny yes. Dude, um, who says, uh, and it's another long question, so I'll just summarise that he wants to know the effects of running a wider tyre versus a wider rim. What's the difference? Good question. Um, so, just to illustrate the point with a bit of an extreme here, if you had uh, the same tyre. Uh, put on a wider rim, then you might square off the profile, um, and but you might also get more support effectively um, in the sidewalls. Uh, but the, I mean, this, there's there's sort of nuances in the differences. But I'm just. Uh, glossing over here, um, the extremes. If you were to have a wider tyre on a really thin rim, then it could effectively round off the tread pattern, which might be nicer, it might be more predictable when you start cornering. However, this sort of rounded profile then becomes a little bit flexy. It can uh, deform and feel less supportive. Um, so the reason I want to explain that is because usually there is a tyre rim that is ideal for a particular width of tyre and those combinations are supposed to work together to give you a good balance of support and tread um, profile effectively. Uh, however, the big difference in why you would choose bigger tyres over rims effectively is that a bigger tyre is the only way you're going to get a bigger air volume and that's the only way you're going to get that cushion uh, and you've mentioned up front so I assume you're thinking about cushion and shock absorbing and the bigger tyre is the only way you're going to get that. A wider rim isn't but you just want to choose that rim to match the tyre afterwards, I would say. Yeah, I think it's a whole can of worms. There's it lots is. lots in there. I would say just be mindful of if you're running like a 35mm or 30mm rim, that you're running a super wide tyre, yeah. so you're not like having really weird really shaped square. profile. Yeah. And also just tyre pressure. Like, yes, you could run like a really big uh, tyre and you could run it on a narrow rim and it may be in... Like you might off have some instability because of that platform, but if you put more air in, yeah. up to the recommended pressures, not over. Or go for something with a better sidewall support, uh, maybe that like can a help DH too. casing. Yeah, for that can help a lot. Or the enjoy. That would help. That's good. Mm. Yeah. And what have you got for us? I've got Landslide 4187. Good name. Thank you. Um, is there a correct method for to tighten and adjust a two bolt seat clamp like most droppers posts have? Um, I mean, yes, every manufacturer will have their own guidance, so look at your manufacturer's manual. Some of them have got videos these days, which are super helpful. We've got lots of videos, so have a look at our videos too. Um, essentially, what I do is 
get the saddle at the right height, which for me, I go off what most saddle brands do, which is the nose of the saddle pretty flat when you're on the bike. Obviously, when it sags and moves, it's, that level is going to change a little bit. Um, and then get them both fairly tight um, and then tighten them up to the required torque, which is often quite high. Yeah, they can be really fiddly. I find that I need three hands with these two bolt systems. But what I would suggest is if you're having difficulty with the angle, and that's the problem because you have to tighten up one and then tighten up the other and then your saddle's in the wrong place, I would just nip them up and then it's just going to be a balancing act of loosening one and tightening the other in order to bring that angle to where you want it. Uh, and then you can effectively adjust the, the reach and everything after you've got that slightly better but yeah it can be fiddly anyway that's all we've got time for today owen um thank you for joining me and if they want to ask us a question what can they do hashtag hashtag <laughs> uh gmbn ask gmbn tech yeah. hashtag ask gmbn tech down in the comments of any of our videos as soon as you think it and we'll try and find it and answer it in a show like this thanks for watching thank you <laughs>